All right. Uh, let me share my screen now. Make sure everybody can see screen three. All right, we'll go ahead and get started today. All right, uh, welcome to our uh, webinar for today, which is August 25th. Uh, today we'll be talking uh, about how to ID a phishing email. Uh, so we've got uh, some good information that we're going to present out to uh, on our, we'll be on our YouTube channel and also those who are attending live with us, uh, you know, during this uh, probably the next 30, 35 to 40 minutes as we tackle this, a very uh, hot topic and has been a hot topic for a while. A uh, very uh, critical topic because I think, uh, Lee, you'd probably agree out, out of all the, uh, the cyber events we, we face day to day, phishing emails seem to be one of the um, the most uh, common, uh, we still see a lot of that come through. So uh, absolutely, absolutely. More calls probably about phishing emails, uh, which is great. We love to hear clients call us and ask us about, um, you know, if they, if they, I'd rather them call and, and ask us about an email, then they click on the link and find out for themselselves. So a 30, uh, a 30 second phone call can save you about, you know, two weeks worth of cleanup. <laughs> Yes, it can. <laughs> Definitely rather have the, that that little phone call than than you know roll into an incident response or we've got we're in a, a triage mode. So uh, just go through you know as always uh, we do encourage questions. So if you have a question, uh, you know throughout the the webinar, just go ahead and post it in that uh, Q and A section uh, down there in Zoom. Uh, my Q and A sort of having a little problem. Uh, hopefully that's not the same when everyone's in, but I do see. It seems to be going to be connected, disconnected, maybe some uh, leftover issues with Zoom from yesterday's outage. I guess we'll find out as we go along. So, uh, but even way, if you do have any kind of uh, questions we might can answer for, you can ask them uh, during the during the uh, webinar, of course, or you can always just get in touch with us. Otherwise, um, feel free to ask questions during the webinar. We want to get them answered as soon as we can. Uh, I'd rather answer them when they're asked than wait till the end and address them there. So feel free to put something in the box. Yeah, and you might be able to use, if the q and A's down, can they see the chat or? I do not have chat enabled. So okay, that is gotcha. just uh, yeah. something I don't think I have chat enabled. So. Okay, um, never mind. Uh, no, I do not have chat enabled. All right, so let's go and get started today. So our agenda, uh, a pretty simple agenda uh, this afternoon. Uh, basically, we're just going to talk about some basics. Hey, what is phishing? Uh, you know, why are phishing emails so effective in their attacks? Uh, the scam, I've got a great example uh, I'm going to go through and how it works or ways we have seen it work uh, in the wild. Uh, some things to look out for in a phishing email, so we're going to give you some characteristics of it. Uh, we're going to go through some examples. So as I was telling uh, Lee a second ago in our, uh, you know, in our, before webinar banter, and I've got a, a nice little area where I keep a lot of phishing emails that I received. I'm going to walk through, we're going to walk through some of those and talk about what we see is wrong with them. And I think uh, some of the best ways to recognize phishing emails is to look at some examples. Uh, that way it helps you know what they look like and also what characteristics that uh, you need to look for. Uh, then also we're going to talk about protecting your employees and network. Uh, I think there's some great concepts around uh, and action items you can take on your own uh, with your company and uh, with your employees to protect against these very effective and very common attacks. And of course, we'll have Q and A at the end. So, so let's roll right into well, what is fishing? Now, fishing. This is not the fishing that Lee and I like to do, as far as getting out a boat and catching, uh, you know, some big fish, which you know Lee's very good at. He he loves to send me pictures on the weekend of the big fish he catches while I'm outside cutting grass. So. <laughs> Uh, so it's not that type of fishing, uh, you know, fishing with the pH, and, and really it's, uh, I've got sort of the Wikipedia type definition up here, but it's really just the use of email, uh, you know, in, in an attempt to acquire sensitive information, or basically to, uh, you know, engineer the user into falling to, into some kind of a fraudulent situation. So, um, but it is a process, and generally what uh, you know, phishing is about, one, it's about getting credentials. Um, so that means whether your email credentials, whether it could be your credentials to a website, like Amazon, Zoom, whatever it may be, uh, but that's one of the main goals is to try to bit, get those credentials. Uh, they also often try to get financial information, so either accounts, 
routing numbers, credit card numbers, passport number, any of those items that you would deem as a sensitive piece of information, they're after those. Um, they also tend to come and masquerading or will masquerade popular social media sites, banks, auction sites, uh, even IT administrators. I think you'll see that through the examples I'm going to share with you today that they're very good at emulating, uh, meaning the emails from those sites in order to lure uh, the unsuspecting public into uh, clicking on the link. So this is really what we call social engineering. Uh, they're trying to trick the user into uh, what we always refer to Lee is clicking on that link. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of clickers out there. There are some clickers. They see a link and just go clicking. So I've got some good. We're going to look at some statistics to talk about uh, that. Is how I, bad I, it really is. Uh, so why phishing attacks are so successful? Uh, you know why are we having this conversation? And, and really, uh, it's really the law of averages. Um, it is they. You know email lists are really easy to get um you can get emails and scrape emails off of websites very easily um, i've got some programs that we use uh, in our security assessments that help me find emails that are uh, distributed on the web in various ways Lee, what's some ways you can get emails from clients or how do you normally feel about getting an email i know you help me with those security assessments where's the where's the best place to find emails at what do you what do you what do you mean where the best place to find emails you know on their exchange server or in office 365 you know where that's where all the emails reside yeah but where do we get all the emails for clients that we do this work for what's the number one place we get emails where do they always put their email addresses oh online i'm sorry you're talking about getting the email addresses yeah yeah oh typically oh, all yeah. the contact information is online including their email address yeah sorry i didn't know where you're going yeah so a lot of time yeah, all the, a lot of times um, email addresses are really easy to get, so it's not like it's something that's a, uh, you know, hidden from view. Obviously, you can purchase the email list, but a lot of times you can get email addresses right off the website of the client yep. or the company. So, uh, and, and really when we say law of averages, you know, to the adversary, to the criminal, hey, they're just going to send out one massive spam campaign and they're going to hit thousands tens of thousands of addresses at one time. Uh, very, uh, very easy process to ex execute. And then it's just like you said, the law of averages. You know, yeah. if you send out enough, eventually you're going to get somebody who clicks. And if they know the domain name too, let's face it, email addresses follow one of very few structures. The two mainly being first name dot last name, first initial last name, or just first name. So, I mean, the bad guys yes. got nothing on time on their sides. They don't care if they get a bounce back. They'll just flood it with a bunch of attempts and see what, see what sticks and what bounces back. Yeah, and I've even seen some programs that will generate email addresses. You, you can get yeah. a list of domains, and domains are easy to get and to acquire, uh, and it will just take, you know, a list of names and just start generating email addresses. And it'll just send them out just to see – if they get some folks uh, that would, uh, you know, get some response from it. So, so this is the law of averages. So, it, you know, we do see specific cases where spear phishing does happen. That means that, hey, that particular organization is targeted in some way. They're after that organization. Uh, that's a little bit different type of attack. Uh, but generally speaking, when it comes to phishing emails and phishing attacks, they're successful because they just send tens of thousands of them out there. And, you know, to the adversary, if they get one or two clickers, then this is a successful campaign. So that's one, one of the things they're trying to do is, uh, you know, they're playing a numbers game with this. They figure if they send enough emails, eventually someone is going to click. And as uh, I put in my slideshow there, they get enough at bats, it virtually guarantees at least a few home runs. So um, second thing is the, the law of knowledge. Um, this is where we get into more of the spear phishing, uh, you know, more sophisticated criminals. So if, you know, they will score larger hauls when they tailor campaigns to the victims. Um, it takes more effort, but the payoff can also be a lot bigger. I know we've done this with some of our phishing simulations. Uh, instead of using just a standard, hey, Amazon or, or UPS or something very 
what I would consider easy. A lot of times we will actually go in and configure a fishing simulation campaign based on the client and what may be going on. Uh, some areas of information we may look at, social media posts, we may look at their website, uh, we may look at, uh, I know we've used LinkedIn as a, is a easy platform for us to look at. You know, we, we've used that before to, to in fishing campaigns because we know about the client. We know their habits. We know organizations they're into. We may know events maybe they attended to. Maybe we find out that they've got four or five new interns starting. So why is that big? Why do you think, why are interns, why would you be concerned about new employees being hired? at easy, your company why would target. that be something easy, easy target right? easy targets they don't know the policies they probably haven't been caught up on on training um they're just they're just easy, easy targets so these criminals will use knowledge you know to really customize their campaigns and methods to attack you via phishing attacks i've seen this published in many uh, different articles one particular was with a bank uh the bank uh, published on social media about a group of new interns that recently started the the bank. They had all their names listed there, and you know what happened? It, you know the IT group found uh, you know that they were specifically targeted with the phishing campaign. They targeted those individuals because they knew uh, that they were uh, you know new to new employees, new to the policies procedures. And obviously, when you're new at a job, you want to do what's right. I mean, you're always looking to make that good first impression. Uh, you know, but uh, but knowledge is a big piece of it. So we always instruct clients to be very careful about what kind of information to put on their website. Be careful about putting your emails on there as well. Uh, same thing with social media. And finally, the law of attention. Uh, you know, scams are long flaws and inherent nature. You know, inherent human nature. Uh, you know, success or failure has to do with our attention. Uh, and our attention spans. If our attention is split, then our guard is down. So, Lee, how many times have you almost clicked on a link by you just all of a sudden you see, oh my goodness, and click on it? It happens. It, it does, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know I almost got fooled on, the, on one not too long ago. I think it came from our fishing simulations because I do some financial work, uh, you know, with Abacus, and it came out, hey, you know, one of my biggest, most sensitive areas is you know, billing and invoices, and it, I got an email that said, hey, so-and-so's not happy about this bill or something, and it caught my attention almost immediately, like, oh my gosh, I have a, and I realized it had one of those markers to let me know, hey, this is not, probably not a legitimate email. Yeah, well, so, you, you, you mentioned a good thing, you know, well, something worth mentioning is they seem to, not all the time, but a lot of time, put some kind of sense of urgency behind it. Like you said, just right then, that'll give you yes. the urgency to click, to find out more, to try to defuse the situation or, or get more information. Uh, so Absolutely. They'll, they'll put urgency behind it to, to, to lure you in to click. It. So, you know, it is important that as we, you know, we have to be attentive to what we're doing. And, you know, when we see emails, even if it's someone we know, we need to give it our full attention just to make sure that it's not uh, anything suspicious or something that uh, we should be concerned about or that could cause us some problems. All right, so let's talk about how the scam works. And this is an actual and real uh, scam that we saw happen. So I'm going to walk you through this. This is what we call a BEC or business email compromise. The goal of this scam initially was just to harvest the credentials of the end user. So the victim, you want the victim to give you their email credentials. So that's what the target or way this scam would work. So uh, the user initially saw this type of email. So it, it actually came from an email of someone they knew uh, that they do business with on a regular basis. And it came in with them sharing a, uh, a, Dropbox document, and you know, hey, do you want to view the Dropbox email here? So very, very get, common practice. Common. I mean, it's hey, we share files and folders all the time. You know, we we use multiple different, a lot of different platforms. We use Dropbox. We may use share file. We may use SharePoint. So this is a great and very successful method we see used. Uh, you know, for these type of attacks. Well, of course, the person wanted to access the file, so the next screen they got was a landing page. And so this was a landing page that was constructed by the criminal. It, it's supposed to be looking legit. 
it says, hey, you know, your verification is required. So basically, if you want to access this document that someone you know has shared to you, then you need to verify, uh, you know, there's some kind of verification you have to do. And this one, of course, was email. So this person, the victim here used Office 365. So, of course, they clicked on the Office 365 link, and all of a sudden, they're presented with the landing page. And this is obviously not the Office 365 landing page. Uh, that is actually in use by Microsoft. It was a fake landing page meant to do nothing but harvest their credentials. As you can tell, if you look at the, the actual URL, and this is always a good marker to look for with phishing emails, the, the site or this landing page that, they, that the user was led through from the phishing email was actually hosted on a web server out of New York that had been compromised, the Senior Services of Albany. Uh, actually reached out to these folks uh, once we started doing an investigation, uh, let them know that their website or web server had been compromised. They basically said they knew about it. They just didn't have the resources or money to fix it. Um, I told them exactly what the problem was. It was a WordPress site. It, it was uh, behind on updates and had a flaw in it that the person has exploited. So, uh, you know, this is how quickly it can happen, but you can see some of the uh, the methods and tactics used by the adversary in order to, uh, first of all, just get your credentials. Now, Lee, what do they do once they got your credentials? Well, for, I want to mention one thing first. Hey, you land on this page, you throw your credentials at it. Guess what? They don't work. That's you throw, right. You throw more credentials at it. So they're collecting all these passwords that you think your email password might be. Yes. And it's important that you don't reuse passwords. Yes. Just because that, because they're collecting all of them. So, so yeah. you know, so then they turn around and with that list of passwords, which let's face it, most likely your top three, one of them's probably correct. They've got access to your email. But then again, you tried your, you know, standard password for your bank and for that. So they're collecting all of those. Keep that in mind. Yeah, that's a that's a that's an excellent point because when you hit the sign in page, it obviously doesn't take you three sixty five. It just says, oh, your login wasn't found, and you're like, oh, what happened? What's going on? Well, you try another password because you think your credentials are incorrect. That's part of the scam. Yep. Uh, so not only can they harvest what could be the correct credentials, but they could harvest other credentials that you have may have used, you may have used in other areas or, you know, in the past at other websites. So uh, so this, this type of scam can not only turn in and compromise your email, but next thing you know, you log on Netflix and you got some person streaming off your Netflix account. You have no idea who they are. And, and, uh, and, and after they collect the credentials and they got a good credential to get in, they log in, they do one of two things. They squat and watch. Yep. Or they go in there and set up mail flow rules and they start sending out more emails where this is where phishing gets tricky because it's coming from a legitimate address. Right. It, it, within a company that you probably email back and forth with but the email is fraudulent. The contents are the actual email sender is real. So that's why phishing is so tricky. After the initial break in, now this person's sending out emails to their whole address book. That's right. And everybody's like, Oh, you know, I know John, John sends me emails all the time. This one looks suspicious. What's John up to click down the right, same rabbit hole. These guys <laughs> yeah. are collecting all these, all these credentials. So, or, yeah. Or they finally get to somebody's mailbox that's like I mentioned that's got I don't I don't I don't know a C level name person they'll sit in those and squat and watch business workflow and whatnot and I wouldn't doubt that they probably collect that information and probably sell it to the next next hacker hacker up the ladder because that's that's really important information and it really concerns me with what people keep in their email. Yeah, yeah, you, you man, you got a lot to unpack right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think that yeah, the two things are a. Hey, once they have access to your email, they're gonna do. They're probably gonna do one or two or both things. One, they're gonna they're gonna watch your email, and they're gonna peer into what you're doing, who you're working with, what transactions you conduct via email, how you conduct them, what forms you use, and who the contacts are. Two, right. they're gonna you will now become part of the scam. That's right. Because now they're going to access your address book and use it to proliferate what they're trying to do. So not only do you could you become a victim, now you become part of the overall scam as well. And uh, so if you look at sort of the next steps, I sort of walk through what the fraud looked like. And this was a, a fraud of the company we work with. Uh, obviously, the hack was 
the Office 365 email account was compromised through this phishing hack. So the user did fall for it, um, and they did find their account had been compromised. Now, what happened about this was really sort of unique. Uh, ended up going to, uh, you know, or landed at, you know, initiating a fraudulent wire request, which we've seen this quite a bit. Uh, a lot of uh, wire transfers happen via email. A lot of financial transactions ha happen via email, which result in either wire or an ACH transaction. So what happened here is the person had compromised as they went through their email. They realized, uh, okay, this person uh, initiates wire transfers to Oak Worth Capital Bank, which is a local bank in our area. Uh, this is the contact they use. Uh, here's the form that's used. So what did they do? They started creating email rules, the first of all. So now they can sidestep the actual user and they can intercept email conversations, uh, you know, about whatever fraud they're trying to do. What was also unique is they also went out and registered a new domain that looked really close to the victim's domain. And actually created an email account for the person who is the overall approver of the wire transfer. So this is a little bit unique that we saw here. So uh, it was just that the new domain was literally just one letter off. Uh, they actually registered the person's, the approver's name. It looked just like their legit email address. Because remember, the person who compromised, who made this original compromise, they see the entire workflow. And they can gather in all this information and now all they have to do is find a way to replicate it. Uh, so they were successful in doing that. They found the wire transfer form. Uh, they utilized it to the T. I mean, it looked, we saw the wire transfer forms. It looked just like a legitimate wire transfer form. So what did they do? Uh, they used the fake domain and email to authorize the transfer with the compromised employee. And that, that employee then uh, sent an email to the bank. Uh, actually to approving the wire for transfer. And like I said, all this was exact. It looked really, really almost exactly like a normal wire transfer that they had done in the past because the adversary used that information and represent. Now, of course, what stopped it? Uh, the biggest thing was the phone call. That's what stopped it. So uh, in the end, uh, Oakworth called, which they have protocols in place. They're supposed to follow that protocol. Uh, they they uh, called to verify the wire transfer request for $45,000. Of course, the client said, hey, we didn't authorize that, and the fraud then stopped at that point. And then it was recognized something was wrong. They called us. You know, at that point, we got involved and helped them uh, resolve the situation, which generally, uh, you know, at that point in time, we just reset Office 365 uh, on their, their passwords. Uh, and now, you know, since MFA is rolled out, we always want to implement that as well, especially for financial sensitive employees. So this is what the scam looks like. So it's not just about getting credentials, but it's also about doing some type of fraud. Um, so we and we've seen other uh, types of scams like this happen. Uh, wire intercepts where wiring instructions are sent via email. Those instructions are intercepted and said, hey, no, wait a minute transfer it here and we've seen some companies lose significant amounts of money uh you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to different types of scams like this so this is why phishing uh is such an important topic uh you know to us and it needs to be uh to all clients and organizations because uh, it can have a a major financial impact uh through these type of scams that we see well, you got anything to add to that? Uh, you mentioned MFA, and MFA is not foolproof. However, it is an extra hurdle that they have to deal with, the bad yes. guy that is. Um, so we strongly recommend MFA, but just know that it's not a 100% solution. They've got, they've got tricks, and they're all done with phishing emails, and they end up sending a request straight to Microsoft to get the MFA push to your phone, and they'll collect your password and your MFA key if you're falling for it. And then they'll just go ahead and turn around and log in Office 365. So it, it's an extra hurdle they have to deal with. But again, I just want to reiterate, it's not foolproof. And we strongly recommend it because it's better than not having it. But um, I just want to. I, just want well, to I would say the level of sophistication that you have to go to to bypass and multi-factor authentication process is really high. You really have to know what you're doing. That's not something that a standard person or a normal person or just a, 
you know, drop by adversary is going to have, yeah. that's going to be someone who's really got some skills. It cuts, uh, some good it cuts skills. The, the bad guys down to a fraction. It does. Yeah. I think at that point you're probably can get on, Hey, I'm being targeted list there. So, uh, so this is a great example. Of one of the common scams we see, and uh, I, I think it's a hundred percent preventable. Uh, you know, Hey, make sure that the bank has to call you to authorize the wire transfer and, and make sure that process happens. So you can verbally uh, commit to that. I've also seen, uh, you know, where they will emulate, uh, you know, a, a C level person's email will send the person to the person authorized it and said, Hey, I need you to, to uh, transfer our, our wire information to this client for this invoice or whatever it may be. They'll send it to the financial person and they'll put a sense of urgency on it. Then the financial person will go ahead and do it, you know, and send the wire out, even though that may have been uh, a spoofed email and didn't come from that C-level exec. So a and, lot of ways this can happen. Make the phone call. And this example, I know this happened a year or so ago. I can't remember. But you say they modified the domain name briefly. Was it, wasn't it like adding an extra L or some small letter that was like you really had to, you know, zero in to see it? Wasn't it something like that? Yeah, it was. It was just a very simple modification to the actual uh, domain. They were actually an extra letter. Sometimes we'll see an I replaced with a one as a number. Right. So they that is a common tactic in order to sort of spoof an, a known email address. If you don't pay attention to the domain, uh, it may not be the actual domain. Um, so let's talk about, you know, what you need to be looking for. Uh, I think one, if the email asks you to confirm any personal information, that should be a red flag. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, the probably the the best example i can think of here is to reset a password uh, if you know that you didn't request the reset of a password but you get an email uh requesting to reset a password then that should be a red flag uh, i would say never just blindly reset your password through an email you weren't expecting go to the website and reset it through the website uh, I know one too long ago we used uh, in one of our campaigns with our security assessments, we used a password reset email from LinkedIn. It looked just like the LinkedIn password reset. And, uh, you know, out of the 50 to 55, 60 employees, uh, I think 50% of them or more clicked on that link to reset that password. Uh, so that's something very common and, and very easy way to get credentials from someone or, uh, you know, or, or to gain personal information. So always be aware yeah. um, of that. And, and, and with that being said, too, if, you know, it doesn't hurt if you get an email from Dropbox or something like that and it's saying, hey, we need your credentials, actually open up your web browser, go to what you know the good link is probably saved in your favorites or something like that. Log in there first and make sure that this information you're reading is, is to be true, whether it's a password or reset. Because if, if you're wanting to reset your password, when you log in, it's going to ask you to reset your password. But that way, you know you're at a legitimate link or you're at the, the correct website, not trusting the hyperlinking of the email. Yes, because you can click on a link and, and they may take you to a page that looks like Amazon's page or, or looks like 365 page or looks like a legitimate landing page to reset your password. Right. Uh, and But then it's not that because what's the first thing you have to do when you reset a password? You have to provide your normal or your original password. Yep. You know, that's something common we see. They say, here's your username. We'll type in your existing password and then add the new password on the bottom. So then where they have, they have your password. Um, your password at that point. So always be aware if you get an email that asks you to confirm any kind of personal information, we talk about email addresses, but if it's bank account information, your driver's license number, any kind of personal or sensitive information, um, you know, be very aware of, if, especially if you're not doing an operation that wants to ask for that, uh, that it just comes out of the blue, you're not expecting it, then you need to be aware of that. Uh, you know, if it's asking you to do that. Next thing at the web and the email address and all look genuine, we'll look at some examples around that, uh, but it's easy to look at a URL, it's easy to look at an email address, and it may not, it, although the name that is displayed may be familiar to you, if you look at the email address behind that or the domain used to send that email address, 
it could it may not look right it could be a separate domain it may look really odd or definitely out of place don't always go by the display name it is very easy with almost any type of uh, sending email system to change the send as name it's not hard to do uh, and in most cases uh, most either SMTP servers or any service you use to send email will allow that to happen in many cases so be aware of that uh, also the email is poorly written you know what bad grammar bad spelling poor sentence structure I've got some great examples of that we can look at but if the email is not constructed in a way that you would see professional or maybe it's not constructed in a way uh, that you normally receive a communication from that person hey some emails I get from certain people are extremely detailed some are not so I know if I get an extremely detailed uh, email for someone I know is usually not very detailed something's not right there so always be aware of not only just you know how if it's written poorly from a grammar and spelling but look at the the context of the email and how it's written to you because uh we fall habits there yeah and, and, you know you'll see they'll be formatted funny too yeah indentions will be <laughs> off low res photos or logos just some stuff to look out for yeah you know squashed up logos we see that a lot you know they're really other yeah, skinny uh, you know, they'll have, you know, very poor links. So we can, I've got some good examples. We can look down on that. Next, the message is designed, designed to make you panic. There's a sense of urgency. Yeah. This is the social engineering aspect of it because now, hey, you're that new employee. You just got an email that's asking you to do this task, whatever it is, uh, and you want to make sure you do it correctly. You've got pressure on yourself. There's a sense of urgency that's been created from that person. Maybe it's your manager, maybe it's uh, your supervisor, maybe it's uh, the CEO of the company. But hey, they've asked you to do something and they want it done now. And uh, and a lot of times we see that built in these uh, phishing emails, but not just from corporate. But I see a lot of them built in, a lot of this characteristic built in to just phishing emails from uh, make it look like it's coming from the IRS. Yeah. It can may may look it's coming from the Department of Labor. Um, I've, I've actually gotten uh, some regarding park it t parking tickets in cities I've never visited with my vehicle uh, that says, hey, your license is going to be revoked if you don't pay this parking ticket. Uh, things like court appearances. I mean, the list goes on and on. But in the end, they usually design the message in a way to make you panic because when we panic, you know, a lot of times we lose our, lose our cognitive ability to make good decisions. We just start reacting. And that's what can get us in trouble. With the, most, the most common one I see here lately in the corporate world is, hey, your Office 365 account yes. is going to expire. The subscription's you know, going to expire and your email is going to be out. So click here, throw your credentials in there to renew yes. your account or to take a look at it. And that gets a lot yeah, of those have been extremely common. They've been the, um, <clears throat> hey, your email box is getting full. Yep. Uh, you know, your OneDrive or SharePoint drive is getting full. We've seen that one too. Or, hey, here's a message that's stuck in quarantine. We need you to release it. Yep. So we've seen some variations of those out there, but uh, generally they will use uh, some uh, some portion of that to create a sense of urgency where, hey, I'm going to lose my email if I don't fix this situation very quickly. Uh, so that's that sense of urgency. Uh, then lastly, there's a consequence for not replying or responding. So we sort of hit on that here and with the last point, but <clears throat> either, hey, there could be a lien put on your house or, hey, uh, you're going to get penalties from the RRS. Uh, your email is going to get shut off. Uh, there may be some kind of consequent listed in a in a email impersonating someone you know that, hey, we're going to stop doing business with you. Uh, or maybe it, it could be someone within your organization. Hey, if you don't do this now, then I'm going to write you up. There, there's always usually uh, some kind of negative consequence for either not replying or responding or, or obviously not, not following through with whatever that phishing email may say. So so these are, are very, I would say, very broad, but some very common characteristics of phishing emails that we've seen. Uh, something you definitely need to keep in mind uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, the suspicious attachment. Uh, if so, if you weren't expecting an attachment for someone, don't click on the attachment. <laughs> uh, so I can't, I can't, uh, I know a lot of us have antivirus. 
We have, uh, you know, all types of security tools, but I can tell you right now, all that stuff can be bypassed pretty easily. So just because uh, you have, uh, you know, some of those security features in place, it does not guarantee that uh, some type of attachment may be setting off some type of malicious software. I know, I would say, Lee, most of the time we see ransomware happen. A lot of times it happens via email. Is that a pretty fair statement? Fair statement, either whether it be corporate or personal, one of the two. Yeah, uh, we, we've seen that recently where, yep. you know, we've had employees access personal email on their corporate account and they got a phishing email uh, on their personal account. I think it came through Gmail. Uh, they opened an attachment and the next thing you know, uh, you start seeing, uh, you know, files and folders uh, on their drives just getting encrypted you know, just over and over because they use their personal email. So, so be always be aware of attachments. If you're not expecting an attachment from someone, uh, just call, you know, ask them, Hey, did you mean to send this to me? If they share a file to you, you know, uh, share a file uh, to you from a, a platform or through email. Hey, just call and ask them, verify that they sent it and they meant to send it to you, meant, meant to send it to you. All right, let's have some fun. Now we get to look at some examples. So I am going to drag my own Outlook over here and you should be able to see the screen. So this is my corporate Outlook. So I've got this folder down here uh, called infected items that I like to keep. Um, and it's pretty fun because then it allows me to sort of keep some examples. I use a lot of these examples, uh, you know, in many of the, um, different types of webinars and seminars that I sometimes speak at. Uh, but I'm going to walk down through some of these and you'll be able to see some of the, the odd stuff here. So <clears throat> this is an email uh, from someone that I received um, that I don't know who they are. Um, I don't know who Mr. Vaughn is. Uh, you know, looks like this was came from, you know, made look like come from no before. This actually may have been one of our phishing simulation emails. Uh, one that we use, we send out phishing emails across Abacus, and I think this is what that is, is one that was meant as part of our phishing simulation we sent out. But this does have the characters that we're looking for. Obviously, hey, you've got a billing error in your invoice, so that goes back to one of the things I think I'm more sensitive about. Hey, I provided your invoice once again because there seems to be a problem with the one we received from you. Hey, please review it, click the link, send it back to me. So uh, I think couple of things stick out. What do you see on this one, Lee, that sticks out to you? They'll let you know it's a phishing email. Uh, I, you know, I see the urgent urgency in there. It says final account in there. Like, hey, it's almost like, you know, there's your urgency in it. Obviously, an error in your invoice, but this says final account. Like, it's the last time they're going to try to contact you. Uh, very plain email. Yeah. Uh, very suspicious link. Um, if you hover, yeah, hover, look at, if you hover over the link, that's where it's actually going. So it's a hyperlink. That's not the actual link it's sending you to. If you hover over it, you can see the actual link that it's actually directed to. Yeah, it's going to uh, the domain cnn.compromisedblog.com. So I'm pretty sure this is one of the note before emails. Yeah, looks that like I, that I usually get uh, on the core base. So uh, we do routine phishing simulations even within our company. And this looks like one that we got through note before, which is a platform we use to do that great platform. Uh, we schedule these simulations that go out. I believe uh, every two weeks we send just a bunch of emails out to our, our staff to test their knowledge. We'll get to that in a minute, but, uh, but this is one, it looks like one of those emails. So it has some of the characteristics we're looking for. Um, GD, uh, GDRE services. I don't, that's not a company we do business with. So the, out of the gate, that's suspicious to me. Uh, that's not someone I know. I know we invoice. That's not some invoice. I think another thing too, it says hi, Brian Jackson. Most people that send me an email say, hi, Brian. They don't use my last name in the, in the, uh, the, that part of the email. So that's always something also looking suspicious. They don't have any kind of signature other than their name, uh, there. And obviously, you know, you can see, uh, some of the email address as well. So this is a pretty easy one to figure out. Uh, you know, it does have some more, you know, you really, it has some characteristics we're used to identifying that not everyone, uh, would identify here. And obviously if you hover over the link, you can tell that it doesn't, it goes to a weird website. Um, so that's uh, probably one that we use in phishing simulations. Uh, here, here's a really good one. Uh, I think this is pretty obvious, right? <laughs> um, 
obviously I don't know this is the email address it came from uh, adm.bjacksondsc at sunrise.ch where do you think this one came from China China of course <laughs> <laughs> dot ch uh, and, and this this it has those characteristics hey you failed to receive seven messages oh no I have failed to receive seven email messages so I, I need to get those email messages back so it says you have seven undelivered pending emails uh, you know for your office 65 account uh, so that has you know hey there's are there's that sense of urgency um, there is of course the header that was added to the email, hey, this message was sent from a trusted sender. We're used to seeing those banners pop up now that may give us some information about the sender. Well, they, the, the adversary here has added that banner for us and then told us, hey, I'm trusted. Hover, um, over, it, hover over review message. I'm interested to see what that comes up with. Yeah, mail.gallopmail.com. You know, it looks like it's, it's hosted on azureedge.net. So, They've actually built some Microsoft-ish type sounding uh, language into it. Um, I also thought that, hey, this message was sent with high importance. So, I mean, you <laughs> see there's that sense of urgency. You've got that consequence. Uh, obviously, I think the biggest, most obvious thing is, is hey, this stuff right here is obviously not legitimate. The, the B-Jacks and whatever they were trying to type there was not going to work. Um, so that's something. Look at the date. The date format sort of weird. Uh, five nineteen twenty eight or five twenty eight. That's not a, a date we date type we usually see in Office three sixty five email. So again, this one has the same characteristics we talk about, but I think this one was pretty easy to identify uh, what's going on there. Um, let's see. Here is another one. Uh, oh, here's a good one for sharing uh, email. Uh, CR, CRG admin group. See, I don't know who these people are, uh, but they sent and shared uh, something through Box for accounting administration. Uh, they sent me a PDF that they want me to click on. Uh, it goes to Box, which I'm obviously not going to click on it, but it, it does uh, or can be. This could be an infected file. It also could have another link that takes you to uh, a site to download. So this one. It sort of has, doesn't have these characteristics that we saw in the last few emails, but you know what? It does uh, does have that, hey, I wasn't expecting anyone to share this to me. Um, it's, it sort of came out of context to me as well. So uh, immediately I'm like, hey, this is probably not something that uh, I'm going to click on because it looks suspicious to me. Is that a bad uh, knockoff of Dropbox? I've never even heard of Box. Is that even real? No, Box.net's real. I've used it. It's, it? it's pretty okay. good. It's, it's like right. a Dropbox equivalent. It's pretty okay. good. But you can tell even within this, hey, go download our app. Um, that may be part of the scam as well. A lot of times the links uh, that you see, any link you see may go to the same place. A lot of time I've seen that happen, uh, but they have some different information down here. You can see this goes probably, the links down here probably go to the same place. Yeah, for the most part they do. So it's you, you can't always just trust the, you know, you're always, you may see and identify, hey, well, this is a suspicious link, but you also can't trust any link in that email. Because even if they have links on the about or in the, the footer of the email about and your notification settings, that could all be part of the scam as well. This so, could this could be a, a compromised box account where they're sending out stuff. They yeah. could be going right back to box, but that accounts or they Very may account to host malicious files that could uh, contain malware or who knows what. Uh, you know, here's one uh, mail delivery failure that happened. Uh, this is actually meant to emulate our support email. Uh, so uh, you can tell here that it, it came from the Sendaz. Remember what I said about the Sendaz? Uh, Avix IT, they put the Sendaz as that, but you can look at the domain. The actual email address that sent it was, uh, you know, A-S-T-O-N-K dash limousine. That looks really odd to me, it's suspicious, definitely not uh, an email. Uh, you, you do see a little bit of that urgency there. Uh, message that you sent cannot be delivered. Um, you know, you need, there's a permanent error. So you, you've got, hey, there's a problem you need to solve. But also you get that sense of urgency down here. The message expires in 48 hours. So if you don't take immediate action, you take action at a certain time, then uh, something's going to happen. I think the big indicator for me here is uh, it came from the Abix IT support team, which 
we don't send emails out that look like this to uh, to people about their email. Um, uh, this is another good one for a OneDrive um, email transmission. Uh, it's got a, obviously a probably was probably a malicious attachment. Uh, and, and, you know, you can see this one looks, doesn't look legitimate at all to me. It's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, you have the, uh, the weird OneDrive, you know, up here at the top. Um, you have, you know, an email address that doesn't look right. So these are pretty, pretty easy and simple to figure out. But it does have the attachments, so you've got to watch for that as well. Um, let's see, there's one down here. Oh, this is a big one. This is one I get actually a lot. Um, yeah. Voicemails. Um, we love getting voicemail to emails, a very popular feature. Our telecom group, um, you know, we're always sending that up for clients. Uh, so I see a lot of these come through, um, especially with Skype, Ring Central, and uh, I think there's one more I can't think of it. But, you know, this is one. We don't use Ring, Ring Central, in, in, you know, within our, our company. So this is an obvious fake. But if you were someone who used Ring Central, you would need to be aware of this type of uh, phishing email. You can see the, the domain clearly is not Ring Central. It's come from what looks like a address hosted uh, out of Japan. Uh, the number, now that is a legitimate area code, of course. You know, look at the the uh, the opening of the email. It's just my email address, so that's usually not right. And then, of course, it has the link in the form of a WAV file because that's generally how we get those emails. I get these a lot, um, you know, especially from Ring Central and seems like Skype. I have gotten one from Zoom, I think only one of those because they also have a platform for phones as well. So so those I think are pretty easy uh, to figure out. Now I want to find one here that I did want to. Uh, here's one for uh, JP Morgan Chase. Uh, it has remittance advice for me to look at something there. You can tell as I hover over the link is going to uh, you know some weird address, France dash cancer dash whatever. Uh, and it also came from a, a, da, a dot .jp email address. Um, I've got one from Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Raymond James. So, I mean, they all look the same. This is obviously part of some type of phishing campaign against my email address because you can see all those happened basically within a week. And they tried a bunch of different types of uh, email address. Now, uh, here's one, uh, what looks like for LinkedIn. Uh, it looks very suspicious to me. Uh, so this would be a good one where they, hey, confirm you know this person. Um, I actually went out and looked them up, and they were not legitimate. At least this, this, um, this the company's legitimate, but the actual individual was not. This is an interesting one here that I thought was um, – that really caught my attention. Uh, this The person who sent this email or the person's name who attached it is actually somebody I used to work with at a prior company. Uh, and – you know, when I saw when I saw the name, I'm like, like, you know, did she mean to send this to me? You know, so it caught my attention, you know, directly. And it turned out, I believe her email had been compromised. And so this is a case where her email had been compromised and now it was being used to send out or, you know, send out more spam email using her account. Uh, this was obviously one uh, inviting me to uh, open a shared document uh, that, have been created and click this link to download that email. So the point is here is that emails sometimes come from people you know. It may not even be in your current organization, but it could be someone you do business with or someone you've worked with uh, before. You're probably still in her global address. So in her contact address, list, yeah. yes. Uh, here's a good one. I got this one from Uber. Uh, Steve McAllister from uh, studybreak.mymts.net. Uh, hey, you know, here's a order to pay for an Uber ride to come pick it up right after work. I'm the designated driver to come pick you up. I have no idea where this came from, but, uh, but yeah, uh, this was a, a pretty obvious fake. But I think it is important to note they went through the process of, hey, they added the graphics to it. They've got, you know, you know, certain kind of things on here. Hey, it's a luxury driver. Uh, there's things like that that try to gain your attention. So we do see legitimate logos, uh, legitimate copyright stuff on these emails as well. So, and as you can tell, I've got just, you know, tons more of these emails that I just get and, and like to keep uh, this from time to time. But, uh, you know, one from FedEx, this is a very, very, very common one. 
uh, we see is FedEx, USPS, UPS trying to get you to to sign off on that one as well. So, uh, so I don't want to spend a ton of time, but these are some just examples of emails that I've gotten uh, that I think uh, this further magnifies some of those features and, and indicators and markers you should be looking for. Uh, you know, within an email that you may get that looks uh, that may not look uh, or that could be part of some kind of phishing attack. So let's talk about mitigation for a minute um, and risk. So how do you protect your employees and network? Uh, so one of the the big, I think, big areas we overcome, especially this overall cybersecurity with a lot of companies is they believe they're just not a target. Uh, they're too small, they're too big, different industries, but um, this actually was some information I took from No Before's uh, report they put out, but as you can tell that uh, there are some categories of business that have more risk built in than others, <clears throat> but a lot of times it doesn't matter if you're small, medium, or large business that you are at risk in some way. Uh, you know, small business, obviously, you're in healthcare is a big risk area. Education is another big, big risk area. Uh, one of our partners sent me an email about, um, I think it was the University of Utah, got hit with ransomware. I don't know how that attack started, but I do know we've seen a lot of school systems, uh, you know, sent, you know, get compromised through phishing attacks. Manufacturing companies are also at risk. But the point of me showing this graphic is really that, hey, this is a risk that affects all companies. It is not a risk that is designated at one particular size of a company or industry. Now, there are some that, that see more than others, but it is a risk that all companies be concerned about. And, you know, Verizon put out uh, their data breach investigation report, and, you know, it's no, no surprise that, you know, 2019, 2020, uh, phishing email remains the number one threat action uh, used in successful breaches, uh, you know, and linked to social engineering malware. So, so there are a lot of different ways that the adversary can use phishing emails to pivot, uh, you know, to either some kind of fraudulent transaction or pivot to access to the network and, of course, to ransomware. So uh, I think it's important to realize, hey, this is a risk that affects everyone. So what are some things, uh, you know, some parts of this risk here that we can talk to? Um, I think, Lee, we, we're into a lot of situations where technology is what is, you know, everybody turns to the next technology tool in order to protect their network. That's what they rely on uh, as their only means of defense. So tell me about what's the problem with that. Why is technology does not need to be your only defense? Well, ultimately, the user makes the decision. And, yeah. You know, if they download a file, the, you know, the, the, the technology is only going to do so much. The end user is going to do the rest of the work. And they, have, they are the ultimate say-so to say, yes, I'm going to click on this link, or yes, I'm going to download this file. Um, all these technologies that are, are supposedly proactive, are always a step behind the bad guy, especially antivirus yes. programs that reach out and get definitions. They get those definitions through experiences learned. And, you know, if you don't get updates or you're behind on updates or you get a zero day, zero day meaning that they're, they're unaware of this vulnerability or this concept of, um, a, you know, of a, a vulnerability, then there's nothing they can do. They're always a step behind. There's nothing that's going to be a step ahead. The only thing that could be a step ahead is the end user. Yes, and I totally agree. Yeah, if they're not properly trained, I mean, like I said, it comes down to them. They're the focal point of your security in, in your environment. Yeah, uh, as defenders with technology, we're always reacting to the threat. Yeah. And and I think especially right now, it, as everyone is working from home a lot more, uh, the user is the firewall a lot of times. They are that end point. And, and we've seen many situations where, hey, you can have millions of dollars of technology there, but if one person clicks on the link, it nullifies every bit of that because that, that ultimately can happen. So uh, I think one mistake we see in a lot of cyber 
uh, you know, cyber strategies is not including the end user focusing on the tools, the technologies, the services, but ignoring, you know, that end user and trying to help them out, understand and let them be part of the solution and not just seeing them as the biggest problem. Uh, and I think that's something, an, an important piece of it is you can reduce your vulnerability by educating the user on what to look for uh, and how to identify social engineering attacks and not just how to identify them. The goal is not to trick them. Uh, you know, you know, as you try, try to train them, the goal is so they will actually make you aware. I want them to report it to IT. I want them to let you, hey, because then a lot of times you can determine, hey, what are some extra steps you need to take? Uh, I'm a big I'm a big proponent of, hey, let's wrap technology around them because we have seen with things like firewalls and EDR and antivirus stop attacks. We saw that happen with, uh, you know, hey, we did have someone clicked on a link and we got the firewall logs because we want to see what's going. Sure enough, you know what? That link was in China or, or maybe it was in overseas and we have geolocation IP blocking our firewalls enabled. So that person, you know, even though they clicked on the link, you know, whatever payload, whatever what that link took them to, they couldn't access it because the firewall blocked them. Right. Uh, so we definitely want to wrap technology around the users, but we, we really need to build up that layer uh, of awareness and, and, you know, make and educating those users so they know what to look for. And, uh, you know, the only way we can really do that is providing with training, providing them with the information they need, and also simulating some of these attacks and testing them, testing their knowledge and simulating some of these social engineering attacks, which is, uh, you know, something that we do uh, with many of our clients and also do uh, with uh, our own employees. So statistically, um, we use the No Before platform, very popular platform. Uh, you know, we set it up, manage and orchestrate it for many clients. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went back through, uh, no before produces fishing by industry benchmarking report. I think there's a great job of illustrating why simulations and why education are so important. So, uh, this is going to walk through a, what is really a three-step process, but phase one, uh, you know, as this is information they gathered from all these fishing, uh, security tests that they did at phase one, they found an 37% click rate. Uh, you know, was the average depending on organization, but it didn't matter what size organization, it was still in the high 30s. That means, hey, a third of the employees clicked on the link. And, you know, that they, uh, you know, by doing so could have initiated some type of attack on the network or given up information or so forth. So after, uh, so that was the baseline. So after that initial run of testing and education was completed over time, Phase two is down to 14%. So after 90 days of training uh, and awareness and education and simulations, uh, they had cut that risk almost in half uh, by doing so. Just in, in just in 90 days, which is really a a you know hey that's a that's a huge gain considering where they started there. Um, and then finally in phase three, which uh, you know up to a year ongoing down to four percent uh you know where you know so this i think gives a great illustration of progression and uh, you know security you can gain through education with your users with your employees uh to let you know how they now become part of the security program not just something as as you see as the biggest risk or biggest threat uh so going down from 37 percent click rate down to just four percent uh you know that's amazing uh, and it didn't just happen, it happened across the board to companies of all sizes and of all uh, industries. This is a very effective way to reduce overall cyber risk uh, in your organization. Well, you got anything to add to that or the numbers speak for themselves? Numbers speak for themselves. I was looking at the uh, categories. I was a little surprised by, you know, manufacturing, legal, and insurance, I think being really high or uh, nonprofit manufacturing and legal still up in like, the high fours, yeah. Gover gov government, you know, healthcare. It's like holy smokes. So, I think this is a great way to illustrate this. Hey, if you if you implement an education awareness system, you do it right. You routinely test 
your users, you give them good quality training that they um, can uh, really help reduce the overall risk in your organization. And remember, uh, you know, 90% attacks begin in what we're talking about today. You know, it doesn't matter if it ends up in ransomware, ends up in fraud, ends up in other some other type of uh, you know threat. A lot of it begins very email. It may not end with email, but it may begin with it. And I think uh, you know having you know knowing how to identify phishing emails, knowing how to identify social engineering situations, uh, you know, you know, and that only happens through education of the end user. So. I think these number these are I think this is a great great report it's, it's available out on the Novi 4 site they've got a lot of really good information about phishing uh, emails how to identify them about their education platform uh, definitely if you if you're in attendance and you have some questions about that then I would be happy to help out help out with it uh, as always as we conclude today uh, if you have any uh, questions or uh, anything we might can help you out with please feel free to reach out to our team uh, you can reach out to me, uh, Samantha or Caroline, uh, and we can help uh, steer you in the right direction. If we can't provide a solution, then we know someone who can. Uh, uh, I'm going to look at q and I didn't see any Q&A or questions out there, so I'm going to close it out today. Uh, and want to thank everyone for attending. Look for uh, this uh, to be posted on our YouTube channel very soon. And uh, as always, if you have